Est-il donc prévu pour corriger le tir dans les pays les plus à risque Wir sehen die Spitze des Eisberges der Verantwortlichkeiten. Je dis une chose, on est quand même hypocrite. Well, I'm afraid what we got was you. European politics provoke a variety of feelings among European citizens. Boredom, indifference, mistrust, confusion. All of these contribute to the extremely low voter turnout seen in all recent elections to the European Parliament. European citizens are obviously not participating in the European democratic process. In the next 25 minutes we will look at this situation with the help of the following nine contributors, representing a broad range of interests. I'm Daniel Hannan, I'm a Conservative MEP for the South East of England. My name is Zita Gurmai, I was the co-rapporteur of the European Citizens Initiative. My name is Emily Turunen, I'm now 27, uh, the youngest member of the Parliament. Uh, my name is Zodoro Francescu, I'm co-founding director of uh, the NGO called VoteWatch.eu. I'm Marc Gruber, I'm the uh, European co-director of the uh, European Federation of Journalists. I'm Lorenzo Consoli, I'm an Italian journalist working in Brussels. I was also for four years and until a few months ago, the president of the International Press Association of Brussels. My name is Wolfgang Kowalski. I work for the European Trade Union Confederation. My name is Sandra Kangasaro. I work as a press officer at the European Parliament. My name is Paul de Klerk and I work for uh, Friends of the Earth Europe. And I'm also active in uh, what is called uh, Alter EU, Alliance for Lobby Transparency. No matter who you talk to, everyone agrees that there are problems in European politics. One of the main problems is the lack of dialogue between citizens and their representatives. Even in the European Parliament, the only democratically elected institution, there is an obvious disconnect between MEPs and their constituents. The basic problem is that you can't have a democracy without a demos. Very few people feel European in the same sense that somebody might feel Portuguese or Norwegian or Canadian or whatever it is. And in the absence of that sense, you have very low turnouts, you have a very weak sense of connection. We are not doing well. There is a huge gap between European citizens uh, and, uh, and us. I believe it is very, very important just to give the chance for European citizens to talk into what we do. We have a gap between the institutions and the very inside Brussels talk and the general population. EU, I think, is a bit better than, uh, than its reputation among people. But uh, we have to have, I think, uh, better, better policies and a more honest debate. I was elected in 1999 on a turnout of 24% in the United Kingdom. Right? More, more people voted the following day in the eviction round of our version of Big Brother than participated in the election that returned me to the European Parliament. And the reason is that people simply don't feel a sense of connection, a sense of affinity, of identity, of community as Europeans in the way that they do at local or national level. There's no European public opinion, there's no pan-European media, there are no real pan-European parties. The standard line you get from Federalist MEPs is if you gave more power to the European Parliament, then we would get a higher calibre of candidate and turnout would increase and people would take it more seriously. We've already tried that. Right? We have empirical evidence from the last 30 years and we can see that the opposite is the case. In spite of money being used to promote voter participation, turnout is lower and lower at each election. Though citizens see the big electoral campaigns every five years, it is difficult for them to follow the European decision-making process. So what tools can citizens use to stay more informed? One example is VoteWatch.eu, a non-governmental organisation which monitors legislation passed in the European Parliament. We focus more on the positioning of the European political groups of the national delegations to see uh, whenever a majority was formed, who was actually forming that majority and who was forming the minority, so that people can understand uh, the agenda of uh, various political groups. And then when it comes to the next European elections, they see the differences between uh, various political agendas so that they have an incentive to, to come to vote. Because if they don't distinguish between the agendas of various political groups, they will, of course, uh, have no incentive to come to vote and uh, the turnout in the European elections is going to stay low. For uh, a regular citizen who doesn't know 
who is not an expert maybe in the European uh, decision-making process, uh, the best thing to do is to try to look at the activities of the MEPs that they know and that represent uh, his or her constituency. And uh, then they can go to the website, we have a search engine there, you can search your MEP by name or by the constituency they, they represent and then see the set of activities that the, that member of the European Parliament did. Although votewatch.eu is an excellent tool, it might be a bit complicated for citizens from outside the Brussels bubble who may lack the basic knowledge needed to follow EU activities. A more user-friendly tool is social media. More and more MEPs are adding Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to their communication strategies. It's difficult for people to really understand what, what is EU doing, uh, why are these policies coming. So there is definitely a need to communicate and update and inform and discuss also with people. I'm very supportive of any communication uh, tools, I would say. I'm very happy to use the Facebook, uh, the Twitter. I was the first member of European Parliament who asked the communication team here in the Parliament just to give us a chance to introduce this fantastic tool. Because, of course, a lot of uh, depends on communication. If European citizens have no clue about it, and if they don't know that they have an instrument right now, thanks for the Lisbon Treaty, they should be part of the participatory democracy, then how can they do it? All citizens can approach me directly by Twitter or by Facebook and I answer personally. So for me that's very important to have a communication on one level. I have a blog, I tweet, uh, I have a newsletter, um, uh, I'm constantly sending out press releases, I do stuff on radio and I do stuff on television. That's my way of communicating with my constituents. Facebook, Twitter and so on, it's very efficient and fast and you can get updates while we are in meetings. You can update from that meeting. So it's kind of a new way to build bridges. When I'm here in Brussels, I can still communicate to people back home. I think when politicians uh, have better contact with, their, with the citizens in general via social media, I think, let's quote them, Facebook, Twitter, uh, it's great. Uh, now the thing is, just consider here at the European Parliament, you have 700 plus MEPs. If all of them are tweeting twice a day, do you really consider that having uh, 1,400 tweets a day would increase your particular awareness? In Europe, uh, the social media are not so important yet. They will probably become important. Uh, they are very important for young people. And um, uh, we still have to see what uh, will happen. For the moment, uh, I don't see yet as a strong influence by the by the social media, but uh, coupled the social media uh, coupled with the the European initiative could be a strong instrument of uh, direct democracy in order to push some decisions from the EU and 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 uh, the EU system uh, in fields where the EU is reluctant to take uh, to take position. As social media continues to grow and improve in popularity and effectiveness, it is expected to contribute to the impact of the European Citizens' Initiative, which will be introduced in 2012. The Citizens' Initiative is an instrument that will allow European citizens to initiate legislation by petitioning the European Commission. This regulation on the European Citizens' Initiative, which has been adopted under the ordinary legislative procedure, aims at providing our citizens the same political initiative that the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament already enjoy. It was an idea which uh, came up under the Belgian presidency when uh, Mr. Verhofstadt wanted to bring citizens closer to Europe. And we said this is a good idea because the participation rate in European election is going down from one election to the next. So we need new instruments to bring the people in the game of the European life. Until now, the Commission have, has the monopoly of in it, initiative. This means only the Commission can bring forward legislative proposals. Now it's also the Parliament who can bring them forward. And the Citizens' Initiative allows to ordinary citizens, once they collect one million of signatures, to have 
a proposal. To kick off the process, uh, first of all, uh, if you have the idea, you need to find six other people in six other EU member state countries. So you have to form a kind of a citizens committee at first, which consists of seven people in seven countries. You have to agree on, on your initiative, on your idea, and then you have to send this idea to the European Commission. If you have managed to gather the one million signatures, the Parliament and the Commission are obliged to arrange a public hearing for you, so they will invite experts into Brussels to have a seminar, maybe half a day or a day and this issue will be discussed there and then of course if your idea ends up in being a law proposal then the MEPs will handle it in, in their normal legislative procedures, the, they will debate, discuss and, and, and vote on, on your idea. We have promised voters that they would get with the Lisbon Treaty a new tool to affect a European political agenda and uh, we have to get it started now and get people involved and yes it could be uh, an improvement, some kind of direct link to the institution where you as a citizen can raise a topic that is important for you. So from 2012, April 1st, uh, European citizens should start the first European Citizens Initiative. And of course a lot depend on the information. We fight it very hard to make it uh, user friendly and of course to have the right website uh, to give uh, proper information. Of course we really wanted to concentrate on citizens because it is called European Citizens Initiative but anybody can be supporters, uh, political parties, well-known uh, non-governmental organizations. I personally consider that uh, it's a good thing to have a citizen initiative but on the other hand it also means in a certain extent that uh, if there is a lack of consciousness or uh, reactivity to problems then there is a lack also of, of political conscience or maybe a lack of professionalism on behalf of the politicians. If there is such a problem that citizens have to make a huge petition, well, what are they doing in the meantime, politicians? That's my question. I think that there's not much awareness of this yet, but uh, it will come when the first campaigns uh, to use the, this new initiative will start. So we are waiting now to see which uh, will be the first citizen initiative. It will be very interesting to see how, uh, in particular, the Commission will react to the uh, first uh, citizen initiative, because the Commission can decide whether these initiatives are uh, in, in line with uh, EU legislation or not. If the citizen initiative demands uh, some intervention in uh, fields which are not covered by the EU competences, then the Commission can say, no, we cannot go on, we cannot propose a law in this field. The Citizens' Initiative has the potential to be an important tool for direct democracy in the EU. However, it remains to be seen how it will fit into the European decision-making process. Although it is a small step in the right direction, it is difficult to see how it can possibly turn the strong tide of specialised lobbying influence in Brussels. The, the decisions that are taken by the EU by default are in favour of corporations if there is not uh, a strong involvement by the media and the public opinion. Yes, we have the impression that Brussels is becoming the capital of lobbyists. We have now more lobbyists here than in Washington. And everybody knows the more lobbyists you have, the more special interests are represented and the less the general interest can come through and impose its view. And what you see now is that 90% of all the lobbying is happening by uh, major corporations um, that, which are very strongly represented and you see that reflected in the policies. Uh, the most clear example is on the uh, financial sector. Uh, before uh, the 2008 financial crisis we've seen massive lobbying of big banks, investors, hedge funds and they were all lobbying for voluntary uh, policies. We've seen what that brought us into, a big financial crisis and in the end it's the citizens in Europe which are paying for it. From my perspective it's, uh, it's a quite serious situation we have because there are very few rules regulating my, as a politician, my relationship with my surroundings or could be companies, could be trade unions, could be NGOs. Quite a lot of MEPs have side jobs. Um, what happened with the MEP scandal was that a British newspaper, the Sunday Times, they um, pretended to be lobbyists and they approached 60 MEPs and asked if they would be interested 
to um, uh, file amendments on legal proposals that the parliament was dealing with. And in return they would uh, get money for that. They have now uh, exposed four cases where MEPs actually uh, did uh, accept this offer and uh, have been uh, talking with the, uh, the so-called lobby group and they have filed amendments on behalf of that lobby group uh, and they were uh, prepared to take money for that. Yeah, there are a lot of people, they need something in competition or whatever, uh, sports and health and uh, education and whatever. Uh, and when you go there as an MEP, uh, this is uh, something, it opens the door in another way as you go in there as a lobbyist. Yeah. Of course I'm a lobbyist, yes, and I'm open for that. Yes. This is, this is um, why it is called um, cash for amendments scandal. Uh, MEPs which are using their influence to influence the decision making in the parliament in return for money and this is uh, what we think is uh, corruption and we think that this should also be prosecuted by uh, relevant corruption uh, authorities. They should not just get away with resigning from the parliament but it's a criminal offence and it should be uh, punished accordingly. What happened uh, some time ago in the European Parliament, uh, uh, that is very bad because uh, three out of 736, we have a stamp on each of us. So that's why we really have to make it clear that the moral issue is a very important issue for us, for European citizens. Lobbies can come and go, they, they can give us some guidance, but that's our own responsibility, what to do and how to do. This corruption scandal a few months ago has sort of changed the atmosphere within the House. I think more people have become aware that we have to do something. We cannot just do a laissez-faire or close our eyes again. Um, but I must also say that a few weeks ago we had a vote in Strasbourg on this register. We have now a shared register with the Commission, that's fine, but it's still not mandatory. What we see now is that there is a, a voluntary register. Uh, we analysed the, uh, the register uh, every couple of months and what we see is that still a large part of the lobby groups or the lobbyists are not in the register. So that's one major problem. The other major problem is that the information that is in the register is often um, either outdated, not relevant or sometimes even misleading. I always use this, the, the example of Business Europe. Business Europe is the biggest lobby group in Brussels. It represents all major companies all over Europe. Um, they claim that they have a lobby budget of about 600,000 euro. They, according to their lobby budget, they are not even in the list of 50 biggest lobby groups in Brussels. That shows very clearly that their registration is not correct. We filed a complaint about that to the European Commission and the Commission said, well, we cannot, because it is a voluntary register, we cannot actually ask uh, Business Europe to provide us proof whether uh, what they are saying is correct or not. So that underlines very clearly that uh, the voluntary uh, register is not correct uh, and it, that needs to change. So uh, first of all, we would need, and that has been a year-long fight, a mandatory register. So it's clear who's working here, who's entering the parliament. Also, it would be nice to have a legislative footprint, meaning that the rapporteur uh, of each report should print who he or she has met in that process to really see if there is a balance uh, between different stakeholders. I took a decision some time ago just not to talk to any lobbyists. I think that I'm, I'm being, I'm aware of this very unfair to most of them because there's nothing per se wrong with so, uh, somebody approaching me on behalf of somebody else. I mean, constituents do that all the time. If you had a, um, you know, if you're worried about living next to a power station, no one would see it as a bad thing to come and talk to me about it. If a group of people living next to the power station all club together to get a representative, why is that any worse? It's relevant for us, of course, to consult the world outside. It is indeed, but it they cannot become too close. And I don't want to have conflicts of interest. Uh, for, for a long time, the argument was to say, well, you know, there is a certain amount of responsibility from the part of the politicians, and there is also a certain amount of, of commercial secrecy to be respected by the private sector. Now, examples in the past months showed that uh, this argument cannot be put forward anymore. We need to be extremely clear about the relations between 
interests being represented in Brussels and uh, uh, policymakers. We think that a strict regulation is necessary. All the lobbyists have to tell for whom they work, where do they get the money, how much money. This would make much more transparency so that the members of parliament, who are often not experts on the issues they work on, know why these people give these advice and others get, give other advices. One of the first things you need to do is to make an absolute ban on any kind of side job for parliamentarians, any kind of side job that is related to lobbying or that can create a conflict of interest. And being an MEP is a serious function. It also has a good salary, so I don't think there is a need for uh, side jobs and, and uh, uh, it's clear that uh, the parliament needs to take that measure for us. I would be ready to put down stronger codes of conduct, but also with clear uh, sanction possibilities. As you know, there are all these plans now to try and tackle the symptoms of the problem with registers and with rules and disclosure. But they're not tackling the cause of the problem. Why is it that lobbyists have flocked to the EU in a way that they are not found in any of the national capitals, not, not to anything like the same proportionate level given the number of people? The answer is that they have correctly identified Brussels as a way of pushing things through that they could never get through a national legislature because it would be unacceptable to public opinion. So uh, a week ago, uh, a number of herbal remedies disappeared from the shelves around Europe. Okay? 20 million people who were regularly using alternative and herbal medicines suddenly found that some of their activities had been criminalized. Why? How on earth did that happen? The answer is it happened because of a persistent and, to be fair, perfectly open lobbying campaign by some large pharmaceutical corporations uh, in Brussels who saw the opportunity to put their small competitors out of business because they can more easily afford the compliance costs of the directive than the little herbalist who grows her own marigolds and turns it into calendula cream in her own garden. Here's my point. That proposal would never have got through either our House of Commons or any other national parliament. There would have been such a reaction from the voters that it would have been impossible for people to vote for it. So the, the corporate interests understood immediately that if they wanted to get this through, the place to do it would be the European Union because there is a greater invulnerability to public opinion here because turnout is so low, because MEPs are so anonymous, and because ultimately the decisions are made by commission officials whom nobody votes for and who nobody knows. And so in the absence of uh, proper democratic accountability, you have government by officials, government by big corporations, government by NGOs, government by every kind of corporate interest, by everyone, in fact, except the ordinary voter. In conclusion, whatever your own personal feelings are about the EU, the only way things are going to get better is through your involvement, whether by using tools like VoteWatch, social media or the Citizens' Initiative, or by directly contacting your MEP. The EU needs more democratic accountability. So whether you are a Eurofederalist, a Eurosceptic or just confused, make the effort to get informed, get involved and vote. The most urgent need when it comes to really building trust with the European institution is to create policies that actually improve people's lives because I don't think you can force an interest, a knowledge or a solidarity from people towards the EU, you have to uh, go through the concrete results that they can feel in their everyday life that the EU is a benefit in their life. This is the general problem with the EU issues. Uh, they are not very popular in, uh, in, in, in the media and uh, they are not very present in the <coughs> information uh, in our countries. And, and uh, the public opinion is uh, very often not aware of uh, very important decisions that are taken. I think this is the epical issue of our generation. I mean, it's, it's literally historic. You know, a historian 100 years from now, looking back at the year 2011, isn't going to be so fussed about what education policy was or what the inflation rate was. But the chances are that that historian will notice whether our countries remained separate countries or whether they merged into a bigger country called Europe.